Yeah, hello, good evening, and welcome to the Global Veg Fest uh, Animal Rights Activism uh, session. Here, yeah, it's about 7, 7 p.m. BST, September the 18th, 2021. Uh, quite an interesting time, uh, and indeed, quite an interesting time for animal activism. We're seeing quite a resurgence, especially in the UK, animal rights activism, single issue campaigns, growth of veganism, plant based diets. Uh, vegan capitalism and all sorts of, of climate change justice campaigns and such like. Uh, and this has been mirrored also around the world. We're seeing a lot of campaigns around the world, real interest and desire and demand for justice for animals uh, not to be used uh, as property. And um, this, 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 uh, this, this, this little panel tonight is, um, uh, made up of, of four gentlemen who go back to the 80s for the um, their animal rights experience so indeed even before back to the 70s so lived to you know a span sort of six five or six decades um this this weekend we've seen some wonderful wonderful panels um some fabulous women a lot of women women only panels we've had the vivas vegan women's leadership uh, influence of the fabulous public health professionals, the Vegan Business Tribe. And we've had activists from all around the world, really. Um, Pakistan today, uh, from, from Japan and from Hong Kong and from Ghana and from Egypt and from Morocco and some Dublin and, you know, Ellesmere Port, a really amazing port. And of course, tonight from New York City too. So, so really some excellent, excellent panels. Um, this one in particularly is, you know, challenging because we're looking at potentially criticizing or critiquing some of these current campaigns. And that's always a challenging aspect. I will say right now, if you're an activist, if you think you're going to Camp Beagle tomorrow, if you're at Camp Beagle, if you've done an animal rebellion protest recently, if you're thinking of doing one, if you're protesting against the closure of first stores, campaigning for veganism, getting out there and doing anything for animals, you know, you've got my support, you've got my respect, you've got my admiration. We've got my, my encouragement. And if we were going to score, it'd be nine out of 10 just for going out and doing it. So don't let anything put you off being active for animals. But, but let's be honest, you know, some activities are not as effective as others. Some are less well directed as others. Some are potentially even or clearly counterproductive. Um, and some of them are unsafe too. Some of them, promote other issues perhaps that we would want to avoid um, there's all sorts of, of, of challenges in, in animal rights activism as we've seen over the last five six decades um, so you know it's never easy to to be critical or self-analytical or accountable or open to an experience or criticism but of course you can either dismiss it, which is easy, throw it in the bin, take some of it on board, listen in, learn, debate, discuss, do whatever you want with it. But definitely don't let it put you off. Let's hope that it will help as we seek animal liberation. So with no further to do, I'm going to introduce um, my, my, my three panellists. Uh, very happy to see Mr. Philip Murphy. Hello, Philip. Hello, Tim. Yeah, uh, Roger Yates. Hello, Roger. Yeah, that's Roger. And Gary Francione joining us from New York. Hello, Gary. Okay. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Um, I should also just mention at this point that uh, it's only fair to say, unfortunately, that one of our guests who is going to join us tomorrow and is actually going to be talking about Camp Beagle, um, Mel Bolton, uh, has been attacked and injured in a hunt sabbing uh, uh, SU today. Going to send Mel's in hospital. A bit badly damaged, but it's, it's okay. And we, we wish Mel very much warm wishes and the best uh, we can. Um, and, and a reminder about how dangerous activism can be and, and how brave activists have to be sometimes. Um, so, gentlemen, um, we're, we're going to be speaking about three campaigns. And uh, we're going to look at um, Animal Rebellion. And we're going to look at um, um, Champ Eagle, and then we're going to have a look at the SACS 
uh, fur store closures. Um, and, and I'm going to invite the three of our panelists to, to, to give some input, um, fairly brief, succinct, um, and then we'll develop it. There is an opportunity to ask questions if you want in the comments. Uh, we may not get around to them until later, but we will get around to them, um, probably, and of course later on. Um, so, uh, and then after that, we're going to broaden it a little bit, and especially see Gary and Roger, perhaps he's not been on a panel for a good decade or so, be very interesting to see some some discourse and certainly invite Gary and Roger to you know be be, be sharing some experiences uh, and wisdom uh, later on um, before that Philip I'd like you to just um you know just talk briefly about animal rebellion Bruce just up to speed because you are actually work with animal rebellion don't you in the USA um so before we invite some comments on animal rebellion what's what's the latest with Bruce quickly up to speed so thank you, Tim. And just briefly, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be um, on this panel participating and also to the three of you, you know, because my my personal activism has been strongly informed and influenced by the three of you. And I have a profound debt of gratitude to you all. So thank you. Um, so with regard to animal rebellion, um, there's actually been um, what I would consider to be some positive movement um, and there's a, a long context. So just very briefly, I'll mention that um, being in the area, I'm located between Philadelphia and New York City. I orient to both cities here in the US and um, most of my activism in New York, I was exposed to Extinction Rebellion early on through left and international media and was involved you know, in the early planning meetings of Extinction Rebellion. And from the very start, uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, hostility towards bringing the animal issue today. And, and here in the US, um, sadly, and specifically in New York, um, that persists and that's really challenging and that's kind of a, a conversation for another time. But globally, m most of my engagement has been more on the global level um, trying to sp spread um, animal rebellion globally and skillfully. Um, but what's been most encouraging for me, um, and this ties into the panel that preceded us here, uh, at the Animal Rights March, both um, uh, Roger's uh, colleague in the Animal Rights Show, Wendy McGovern, uh, and then uh, Bell from Animal Rebellion uh, did some amazing speeches that I thought were exceptionally good because they hit on the issue of the necess necessity of a plant-based food system from systems level change, but underpinning that, the, the absolute need to uh, advance an anti-speciesist, consistent anti-oppression message. And I was really encouraged that by Wendy first, and then uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before, on the Animal Rebellion YouTube channel, they published um, Bell's speech uh, and then Bell interviewed Layla Kasim, who was one of the founders of Animal Rebellion. And there was, there was, there was definitely acknowledgement of the importance of individual change in addition to systems level change. The anti-species is imperative, which in my experience, it's been challenging. And I and others have been among the voices saying that you cannot, in the interest of expediency or however you want, else you want to talk about it is, kind of um, advance, ways to advance more um, frictionless advancing of the plant-based food system imperative. And I've seen a shift that from my seat is both important and really encouraging uh, around animal rebellion. Okay, thanks for that, Philip. And, and yeah, I agree, actually. I think that's less than valid points, but I also was listening earlier and I could see Clearly, some of the problems um, that you know maybe you've referred to in the past, but uh, Gary, um, I know you've been, um, you know, outspoken about um, animal rebellion. And what, what's your take? Fairly briefly, if I may ask, so that we, we, you know, we can cover the other areas too. But what, what what's your take currently on, on especially in light of what Phillips? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously happy to hear that they're moving in the direction, apparently, of recognizing that. Uh, s system change uh, is not something that can happen without individual change, particularly in this context. And, um, I, and I hope that that will carry on. 
but you know, I, 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 I looked at the animal rebellion website a couple of days ago and it was basically the same as it's been, which is it's system change that we're looking for. We're not focusing on individual change and we're all victims of the, of the system that we're not to fault. You know, we're not to blame for this, that, you know, we're all victimized by the system. Um, and I, I have a very strong reaction to that. This is our problem. We demand these products. We, we, we are, if we stopped consuming them, if we stopped eating them, wearing them, using them, then the demand would go away. The problem would go away. The problem exists because we demand. So to say that this is something that, you know, that we, that we, um, uh, you know, are not responsible for, I think is nonsense. I also think it's nonsense to say that we want system change. We, I mean, it's got to be really clear that individuals have a moral obligation to stop and to stop right now um, e exploiting any further animals. That's it. You know, that that if you think animals matter, if you care about the environment, whatever, you stop it. You just, you know, it's not a question of reducing it. It's not a question of, it's, it's a question of stopping it. And there will never be system change. If you want to see a revolution happen, try having a government. It wouldn't happen, but try having a government impose veganism on a population that hasn't accepted it. Um, it would never work. If this is system change that can only happen if there is individual change. So that's my view. Thanks, Gary. I think that's very concise and a uh, very good point. I think echoed actually by some of our panelists from Asia and North Africa this morning, echoing some of that about the imposition of plant-based diets, which is beginning to happen, the sort of you know, capitalism and such like. And uh, Roger, what, what, you know, you're, you're, I think at heart, a supporter of Anna Rebellion, and you have quite a big Anna Rebellion in, in Dublin. Um, you would, I'm sure, agree largely with those points. Uh, yes, I would. And um, it's interesting to what uh, Philip said, and that was reiterated by the, um, the, the kind of session before us, which was the idea that um, animal rebellion really came out of the fact that um, extinction rebellion wouldn't really address the animal question. OK, and so I don't know whether the relationship between those two factions are kind of easier now than they were because the, it was quite fraught in the sense that um, XR wants to bring in the farmers and this kind of stuff. And there's, there's all kind of um, things on that. But in terms of, um, if you like, my opening statement, it really comes from some of the notes I made from the, the last session where um, Leila was saying that um, cultural speciesism is the issue. And I very much agree with that as a sociologist. And she said that, that it's a structural matter, that it's systemic and it's institutionalized. And then she said that institution, um, individual change is not enough on its own. But in terms of adherence to the philosophy of veganism, this is one of the things that an individual can do a lot about. And so, you know, um, it's quite significant to go vegan, in my view, as an individual act of rebellion in itself. And I agree with Gary that obviously the structure is made up of individuals. And then also individuals are influenced by the structure. It's a, it's a question of, you know, what comes first and how can you do it? And I think that at the moment they're in the thing, well, we need, we need a bit of everything. Uh, and then finally, what I did like was that they were saying that civil disobedience was transformative. And they were talking about the rebel role and stuff and, and kind of creating kind of kind of rebels in society. And it's a little bit like Marcuse's idea of the great refusal. And I, and I really like that part of it. But in terms of um, suggesting that the system can be changed by law when the culture has not changed, I think it's a non-starter be because... Um, it's a little bit like when you ban things that people still want to do, they're full of resentment. And you can see that in, um, in the bans on, on, on coursing and uh, on hunting, right? If you can win the argument, then that creates the system change. But if you impose a change on a, on a 
culture that's not ready for it, then you've got a problem. The history is quite clear. That's never worked in, in, in really any context. You can't impose it. I mean, these sorts of things can't be imposed. They have to be, they have to, they have to, it, it, well, the sad thing is that, you know, if we had 10% of the population that was firmly committed to veganism as a moral imperative, that would then shift the discussion away from treatment and away from humane treatment, and all that nonsense, and focus it on the issue of use. If we moved away from treatment, and started talking about use, and we could do that if we had 10% of the population, um, you know, firmly committed to veganism as a moral imperative, we could start a dialogue that could result in system change. But the system change is 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 and to say that in that that speciesism is cultural well so is sexism um but you're not so is that so so are all forms of discrimination they're cultural but you don't change them through imposition you can only change them through cultural change and that is changing of individuals i asked the um philip would just come to you in a second I just i asked jody kazma charter actually the author of ethical vegan similar question really because i think you know, the idea is because we're in such a deeply speciesist society, it looks like it's easier to get people to maybe change a meal or two without committing to a whole change in a philosophical position. Um, but as I think we all agree, at the core of it is how we view animals. And whilst we view animals as commodities, um, that's, that's, you know, that's, there's never going to be really a deep, deep change. There has to be that that change in how we view animals. And if we're as advocates not, not going to keep that in the picture at least, then it makes it difficult, I think, in the long run for people to change. And I agree with what Julie says, is that it has to be that clear bar, is that, look, you know, the ethical vegan position is clearly the one that is as good a solution as we have. And there's a lot of people who agree on that. Um, although although we want to see a shift in systems and such like, we must see that individual change. And it's 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 the key issue is is recognizing the rights of animals not to be used as property. I mean, Tim, that Tim, the can, I, thing. can I make a comment, Tim? And that is how are we going to change the system when the animal movement is not agreed on whether veganism is a moral imperative. I mean, this is what puzzles me, is it is clear to me that if animals matter morally, if they're things, then they don't matter morally, and it doesn't matter what you do to them. If they matter morally, then whatever else we do, the very least we can do is we stop eating them, wearing them, using them, in all of these situations which involve no necessity. Now, it seems to me that if you don't have a movement that is clear on that, crystal clear, then how's it gonna change? It's getting there. But well, uh, yeah, we agree absolutely. Yeah. And Philip, you were gonna, you were gonna yeah. come in there on that. To, to, so. to continue with the the, the import of culture, and and I, I mentioned that Layla in her comments in the previous panel mentioned culture, and I found that, as I said, very heartening. She also mentioned the work of uh, an American sociologist by the name of David Nybert, and I first want to thank Roger who exposed me first to his um, work. Um, and I think it's incredibly important about the entanglement of oppressions and moreover, the fact that the exploitation of animals by nomadic pastoralists are in fact kind of, you could trace back as a root cause of the, what we now have is essentially an unfettered corporate capitalism, the word capitalism deriving in Latin from the, the word for head of cattle, so-called cattle. Um, I think that's crucially important um, and the consideration of the impacts of capitalism and in the US, um, for example, in the in the political system um, is it effectively captured. It's a corporate duopoly, right? And if anyone had any question about that, um, just briefly, I'll mention for folks, particularly outside the US, um, the democratic primary system, when it became you know, there was any chance that a, that an uh, an outsider in the form of a Bernie Sanders would win. They, you know, the the powers that be, you know, settled that immediately. Um, and and where that's particularly important to this conversation, I think, in theory, the the impacts of su supply and demand come into play 
very significantly that if you reduce the demand, um, that's going to impact the, the supply side. But in reality, certainly in the U.S., the, the subsidies afforded by the government to the you know, so-called meat and so-called dairy industry are so massive that that effectively negates the dynamic, the supply demand dynamic. It, it is effectively inconsequential. And I'm, I'm one of the, the projects, I'll give a shout out to my friends at the Agriculture Fairness Alliance, which is a lobbying group that is, is, that is seeking to address, the, you know, in, in the forthcoming farm bill every five years, there's a major bill called the Farm Bill in the U.S. that dictates um, corp, uh, excuse me, governmental policies with regard to farms and, and, and growing agriculture broadly. Um, and if we don't knock down those subsidies, the, the, the other, the, the other per, acts that we're making are, are effectively performative. And I have no interest in performative action, you know. So, so I sought these these folks out at AFA and said, you know, we gotta. Let, well, how can I help? Because that's it, it's crucial, and it shows the the corporate capture. I know this may offend some of the 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 vegan capitalists here who are are participating, in, and I I, I don't offend, mean to offend gratuitously, but. Um, if we don't look at the impacts of what I would consider an unbound capitalism, you know, we're going nowhere. So I'll just pass with that. Phil, isn't it, isn't it the case, though, that the only way you get rid of, you can't get rid of those subsidies unless, I mean, the reason why the subsidies are there is because it keeps the prices of these products low. And, and, and the, if you start raising the prices, if you, get, if you got rid of the subsidies tomorrow, what you would in essence doing would be doing would be making the opportunity costs of owning animal products, whether meat or whatever the subsidized, higher. And so that's just that that's just a question of making it more expensive for people who don't have the money. And that's going to be politically that's as that's as politically charged. This is why I, I think looking at subsidies at this point is about as sensible as trying to impose something by law. It can't work. Um, it can't work because of the structure of things. The reason why the subsidies are there is because the demand is there. And so you say, well, even if you stop the supply, the demand's going to be there because it's subsidized. Or I'm sorry, even if you reduce the demand, the supply is going to be there because it's subsidized. That, but the subsidies would be easier to attack if you had a vegan, if you had a significant vegan movement. The reason why the subsidies are as hard to attack as anything else is because you're talking about a practice which is ingrained. And is po and, and and is is politically very very problematic to try to you know getting rid of the subsidies is like imposing some sort of, is 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 in essence imposing not the ability or the inability to consume animal products on some portion of the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, th I think I think uh, Gary, I think that depends on who wants to change the subsidies. For example, I mean this is a conundrum here. We, we you know we've got philosophy, we've got uh, politics, politics, we've got tactics here. And um, it's all really kind of summed up with that soci sociological quintessential statement, which is that we're free and unfree at the same time. So we are born in, into a structure, which is cultural speciesism and patriarchy and all the, all the rest of it. And, th and then it's a question of what can individuals do? Now, I'm, I've always been an opponent of political campaigning. But of, of all, the, of, of all the, the kind of suggestions about political campaigning, the one thing that may have some merit, I think, is having to go at subsidies. And the reason for that is that we talk to a lot of farmers on the street in Dublin, and they're kind of, oh, well, you know, we, we do this and we do that. And, you know, we, we couldn't change, but we're not against it because we don't want to, you know, use other animals. And, you know, some of them say that. And we go, well, in a vegan world, you'd be subsidized to make a transition. And as soon as you say that, they're really interested. Right. So that would then, then would mean the, the farmers or a significant number or some, I, I, I mean, I'm not going to try and overblow the numbers, but I mean, some, in other words, it's not just us who will be pushing for that. Some of the farmers will be pushing for it as well. And so in that sense, it's got a bit of more of a chance of going to a speciesist parliament and go and ban this and ban that, which, which doesn't work because it's a speciesist parliament. And if you get any laws from a speciesist parliament, they're usually full of holes and they don't work. And then the police won't enforce them anyway. 
But I think the subsidy thing is a bit different, though. I think just if I can jump in briefly. So um, Roger raises a point that I omitted, and apologies for that, about um, the within these proposed changes to this the structure, political structure, um, included with the subsidies is funding that those transitions. And I neglected to mention that. It's a very salient point. The other quick thing I wanted to mention with regard to this, what comes to mind is the um, the classic uh, speciesist trope about, well, if we eliminated animals, um, we'd be overrun by the billions of animals in the system right now. And it's like, it, no, the answer to that, of course, is no, because it would happen over a transition in the real world. And I would argue the same with the dynamics of the demand for animal products as more plant-based you know, opportunities uh, or products rather are available, as farmers are transitioning, that that will allow for a more a smoother transition to uh, a plant-based food system. I, I mean, I think, I think that the transition, I think getting subsidies for transitioning from animal farming to plant farming is a great idea. But again, I think the possibilities for doing that in the absence of a clear and politically organized vegan movement are not going to be great because the pressures, the, the opposing pressures are going to be too great. One, one comment I wanted to make, Phil, David Nybert, I've known for many years. As a matter of fact, um, I, uh, uh, his book domestic, uh, on Domesticration is in the series that I edit for Columbia University right. Press. And I've known David for many years. One issue I think we've got to be careful about is this idea that the problem is capitalism. Capitalism's got all sorts of problems, tons and tons of problems. But animals have been exploited in every single economic system that has ever existed. As a matter of fact, the exploitation of animals sort of presents a problem for classical Marxism, which says that the, 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 the economic substructure determines the, the, the superstructure of morality. Animals have been exploited in every single society, irrespective of what the economics are. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, I, I mean, David and I, we actually were participated in a conference a few years ago in which we discussed this idea that, mm -hmm. you know, capitalism isn't I mean, capitalism is a problem. It's a problem for humans, um, uh, for sure. And we would all be better off under a democratic socialist system, in my judgment. However, the idea that we're going to, um, you know, that getting rid of capitalism means getting rid of animal exploitation is a fantasy because it's existed. Animal exploitation exists in 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 every society, every economic system mm -hmm. that's ever existed. Mm -hmm. Now, and briefly, I'll just thank you, Gary. I I agree and disagree at the same time. I think that um, I don't see the possibility for advancement without addressing the forces of capitalism, but what I would consider to be capitalism unbound. And there's a whole separate story around that. I mean, it's, it's, it's become um, a monolith and technological innovation in communications and transportation has allowed it to move around and avoid being pinned down in a way that makes it, you know, uh, unassailable essentially. And that the, you know, capitalist, capitalist businesses will benefit from these subsidies in place. They make sure they stay in place. I think it's a, it's a lot, I don't want to get bogged down in this conversation, but I think that, and there's some nuance between you say strict Marxists and, you know, free market capitalism that I think we would need to explore the, the, the space between. We ought to have a panel on Marxism and animals. Well, the, the conversation about Marxism is, is difficult now because what Marxism isn't what Marx thought it was. It's not full of all the contradictions that are going to bring it down like, like he thought it was. It's much more subtle than, than he ever kind of theorized about. And so the neo-Marxists then, you know, people like the Frankfurt School and everything, then they started looking at issues like culture and stuff and education to kind of say, well, is that is that a prop for this capitalist system. But there is um, a sociology video that I used to use in my teaching. And it said that, you know, in terms of um, a change in kind of the world, and, and I, I, I do kind of, I do kind of echo Gary in this a little bit, because it's kind of, well, to what extent, but what he's basically saying is that capitalism brought about a system where everything could be bought and sold. And the narrator said, including people, and of course, including non-human people. Um, so I think that in terms of our problem and what we want, capitalism doesn't help, uh, to say the least. And I think in that in that sense, Nybert's uh, position is pretty good. I think 
uh, especially the entanglements idea. And I think we'll all agree with that anyway, the entanglements part of it. Well, folks, so um, just bringing this back to the AXR, I think, you know, it's clear that they're working on subsidies, system change, also getting food, plant-based food into schools, councils have had quite quite big successes there. But I think we all agree that that the that anti-speciesist message should be, you know, clearly there. Um, I, I would assume that part of the idea, and I'm not privy to the whole animal rebellion tactics and such like, but broadly speaking, I'm sure you'd all agree with this too, that the idea is, is well, we want to broaden the appeal. We want people to not, you know, feel they have to be vegan or something to get involved in this issue that affects all of us. And that although we want to encourage people to make changes, we want to have a, a, a big, broad umbrella. So, um, I, I can see the conflict to why there's this debate within AXR, but I think the the, the, the important thing is to just have a clarity. You know, we yeah, have to the, the, thing, the thing, you know, Tim. I mean, I, I wasn't going to bring up that aspect right. of it because you, you when you talked about the school the school plate idea, now the the real problem in terms of clarity there is that they're doing that campaign in tandem with Pro Veg, which is a real reducitarian kind of you know yes. go veggie type thing but, and so what i would say with that is they're working on systems not on individuals and there's a different a different tactics to be played with trying to change uh you know a bunch of people in a school primary for their dinner than, than an individual yeah yeah i was just i was just talking about the clarity point that you made and you yeah. don't get clarity from a group like pro veg well that, I, I couldn't agree right. more <laughs> to a degree but i think pro veg work really well in the areas that they work in which is 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 not individual change but is in changing food systems and and politics and and that may not be our particular choice of, of approach i mean it's certainly not suited to an individual change i think we all agree on that well, if, well if, again if if, 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 if i may i mean i think and not, not not speaking for gary because he, he, he can speak for himself but i think the existence of groups like pro veg are the very reason why gary argues that we don't have a vegan movement right <laughs> exactly that's another, that's another discussion i would take that on board i wouldn't dispute to, uh, i wouldn't disparage that certainly but at the same time i think that um, there's a better clarity now that ProVeg are working specifically in systems and, and food systems, governments, lobbies, institutions, um, where I think there's their, their own approach there is, has more validity um, and more chance of success and progress than individuals. And I think to to approach an individual and suggest that somehow veganism, it's okay to carry on using animals, is, is selling out veganism. It's but, not about to Tim, Tim, one could say the same. that that's okay. So Tim, one could, one could say the same thing. One could say the same thing about, well, animal welfare groups that are proposing more humane treatment are working on the system level. I mean, you could say the same thing. That's the problem. The problem is... Yeah, I get that, but I think there's a difference between saying, well, look, we want to, you know, change food systems so that we have a plant-based food system and we want to improve the conditions of animals who carry on using animals. But the clear the clear anti-speciesist message, and I think, Philip, again, you'd agree with this, it just needs to be nicely there. It doesn't always have to be in the forefront or a condition of entry, but it has to be clearly there. Possibly you would disagree with that as a condition of entry, I'm going to come to that, actually, because I'm going to ask us to move on to Camp Beagle. Now, Camp Beagle, just briefly introduced, is, is an anti-vivisection camp that's happening in Cambridgeshire. It's been happening for the last two months or so, three months. Um, it's, a, it's a breeding facility that I believe is owned by a U.S. company that has similar facilities in the U.S. on a bigger scale, breeding uh, thousands of bigger puppies to be uh, then sold to laboratories for for, for testing. Um, and the, the Beagle camp has shut down pretty much the comings and goings of the dogs for, for sale um, to, to the laboratories and, and has, has caught the attention of the media. And indeed, the Home Secretary um, is, is apparently disgusted by the whole, the whole process. So, so um, 
Cap Beagle, um, Roger, I'm going to ask you to start on this because you do go right back to, you know, 40 years ago, I think we're in photographs. Somebody looking very much like you, or maybe it's just the haircut, I don't know, um, in, 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 in similar d demos from, you know, 1982 yeah. and so on. And, and it did, yeah, a different colour anyway. <laughs> and it colour did, um, um, something of a heavy price for, for that. Um, What's your what's your take on on camp? We, we 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 did have a camp outside the Devil's Tower in Liverpool, which was a vivisection area. But um, I mean, to be honest, I can see in a very complicated way some real pros and cons here. I mean, uh, and going back to what Gary said about there not being um, a vegan movement in 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 some ways, the the fact that vivisection has only just come back, like it has now with Camp Beagle almost like indicates that within the grassroots at least that veganism was so much the moral baseline that everything else was 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 put to one side and and that and that was always the complaint of people like john kirsten and, and mel broughton um who said that you know what what's happened to that spirit of the 1980s when we came into the movement and uh, all of us will probably agree with this when we all came to the movement vivisection was the campaign along with with fur and battery cages that kind of stuff and so suddenly in the in the last few years vivisection was kind of out of sight and so in that sense it's interesting that vivisections come back it's a bit ironic i think that it's come back at the time of covid but it's interesting uh, another aspect of it is that we are dealing with social movements here and so there is a social psychology involved here. A lot of people in the movement and in other social movements, I imagine, need to have a victory every now and again. And they need to have some sense of progress. And so in some weird, weird and wonderful way, I almost like wonder whether Camp Beagle is almost like um, a recruiting sergeant for veganism which might do a little bit of, of, of good in its own terms along the way. The, the real problem with Camp Beagle is you don't know what you're going to get because you don't know what victory means. I mean, for example, we're talking about one species. At the moment, they're trying to recruit dog lovers. But there will be people in the movement who say that if you do that and then they rub shoulders with vegans, they'll come vegan. There's quite a lot of people who would argue that this is a good strategy for creating vegans in the first place. Is you don't you don't kind of have veganism so much at the forefront, but it kind of gets there in the end, if you like. Um, so I think it's I think it's complicated in the sense that it, it does provide a kind of almost like a psychological relief that a lot of advocates actually say is worthwhile, and and some will say like people like Jake Conroy, for example will say that they need it. They need these victories. It's kind of a human thing. And we are in a social movement. And so on that level, I, I can see it. In terms of what a victory for Camp Beagle means, I don't think anybody's in, in, in any way capable of saying. Because obviously, they're going to get the beagles from somewhere else, or they're just going to switch species and, and all, all the rest of it. And so that this is the usual problem with the single issues, is the fact that it's a little bit like moving the chess pieces around on the board in a globalized situation. And so, you know, these companies, which are often transnational, can just move around the globe. And all we're doing is shifting the pieces a little bit. And it might take 30 years to do it as well. So what are you going to get out of Camp Beagle in terms of what you would be able to say is a victory? You know, it's, like, it's like closing the fur farms down. You know, I mean, like it's... It, it's not exactly as good as everybody says it is when you actually look at what what actually happened you know so there is a problem at the same time it's kind of galvanized a lot of support it's got people you know it's got their heartbeat thing it's, it's a central kind of you know gathering point now so it's it's had that kind of movement issue as you say the sabs are going down there so it's like a a, a national hit which is what used to used to happen with the, with the sab and so it's gained a bit of momentum within a social movement set sense. Whether it makes any sense on other levels, I don't think the jury must be out because nobody nobody could know. Tim, you started by, by saying that Roger and I sort of got going in this with the dissection, and that's absolutely true. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time 
focused on um, the Taub situation and on the Generelli situation at the University of Pennsylvania, which is one I, where I was teaching. And um, you know, we had a we had a campaign, and we closed down the head lab, and that was the victory. And then the next thing we know is that they were just using a different species. And it occurred to me fairly early on, this is not going to, I mean, as Roger points out, what does victory look like? And, um, you know, if we're just changing to a different supplier, a different species, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Moreover, if the state, I mean, if we can't convince people that using animals in situations where there is no necessity, no no plausible argument for necessity at all. Um, if we can't um, if we can't work if we can't succeed there, it's not clear to me what the campaign is about using animals in experiments. Because although I think there are, and I've written quite a bit about this, I think that there are all sorts of problems talking about whether it is quote necessary, both empirically and morally, um, to use animals in experiments. There's certainly a much more plausible argument that using animals in experiments is, I, I don't believe it is, and I think it's, I think it's done, but I think there's a more plausible argument that it's, that it's necessary to use animals in experiments than it certainly is to eat animals or to wear animals or to use them in these other contexts. And so it's, it, you know, I, I remember some years ago writing about how in the 19th century, um, you know, you, you had these, it was, you, you had a, an anti-vivisection movement focused, uh, started. And it was it was a very uh, uh, energized anti-vivisection movement, and it was basically composed of people who were eating animals. You know, they'd go to the anti-vivisection you know demonstration, and they would go out and they would eat animals. And so there's a sense in which these these campaigns, like all single issue campaigns, I think you know, as 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 you know, it's no secret that I despise the single issue campaigns. I think they're the, the death of a of a coherent radical social movement. And um, and I think that that um, uh, what what you see when you're talking about you know the the anti-vivisection movement is victories which are they may they may serve some purpose and Roger's dead right on this and he's a sociologist and he's you know and I, I I defer to him on this he he's saying this may serve a, a social movement purpose it may it may help people to get excited and to become involved. I don't think it's going to do a damn bit. I don't think it's going to do anything. I mean, I really don't. And I mean, I think in the end, it does nothing. They're going to get the beagles from somewhere else. If they close this this place down, they'll get, I mean, this has been going on forever. I mean, and and we're using more animals now, you know, for a period of time in the 1970s, the number of animals being used in experiments went down. It's now through the roof. And, and you know, the, the pressures are going to continue to use animals in experiments for all sorts of purposes. Um, the arguments will be made that it's necessary. As I say, I think these arguments are problematic, I think, but I, I certainly think they're more complicated than the arguments for using animals in the numerically more significant context of eating them. Um, but but so what? You shut down one place and they get them from someplace else. And, you know, you stop using dogs because we fetishize dogs and they'll start using, you know, people don't fetishize rodents the way they fetishize dogs or cats. So the fact that, you know, they, they may say, look, you know, we're going to stop using, we're going to stop using dogs. Is that a victory? It will be declared to be a victory. And that is, in my judgment, problematic. So, so this is, Thank you all. I mean, knowing your history with this movement, especially, it's very valuable to hear hear this uh, these these comments um, from my seat. I, I I keep coming back to like, why would this have been the the like the, the movement started here? There's got to be a reason for that. You know, why with vivisection? And what what comes up for me is that I think on a on some kind of like a primal level, it inv invokes unnecessary violence, abuse, torture of other beings that, that I think strikes people as being fundamentally unjust. Um, this is, this is my, my take on it. Um, and I think from that, there's an opportunity if we, by highlighting or the, the anti-vivisection movement coming back to the fore, it's an opportunity to say to folks who are not yet vegan, like 
you agree that this is, you know, oppressive, exploitative, violent torture. You agree, you see that. Let's look at the production, the, the exploitation of animals for food or clothing and kind of just switch that lens. It's a potential opportunity from my seat. Phil, um, Phil the, the, but the anti-vivisection movement has historically not been amenable. I mean, I mean, I don't know about Britain, but I can tell you the anti-vivisection groups in the United States were were um, very much opposed to veganism. I can, tell, I can tell you that. And I think I mean, I, I think the reason why vivisection became an issue in the first place is it allowed people to express concerns about animal use that didn't affect them. Um, you know, it just did not affect them. And when Roger and I got involved with this, it was actually a little bit different because, yeah, we were anti-vivisections, but it was part of this whole, I mean, it was, it was, you know, we were not anti-vivisectionists. Um, we were animal rights people and we looked at, we were doing everything. I mean, we were, we were focused on, on, you know, vivisection, but we were focused on everything else too. And so, you know, in a sense, you could say, well, weren't you involved in single issue campaigns? Well, but the same, we were, we, were, we were trying to take all the bricks out of the wall, as it were. And so it's, you can't really sort of say that, well, Roger and I were involved in any of the No, we were vegans who were, who were focused on a variety of things, um, one of which was vivisection and, and, and what, but, but I, I think we have to be careful about this because the whole anti-vivisection thing is fraught with the, it allows you to sort of, you know, fulminate and get angry about what's happening to animals, but you don't have to do anything about, I mean, you don't have to do anything about yourself. And, and, you know, I mean, most people don't know any, I mean, I, I know vivisectors because I work in a university in half for the past 36 years or whatever. And I know vivisectors. Most people don't even know people on a personal level who do, who do vivisection. It's something that's done by a relatively small number of people. And it's easy to attack because it doesn't, it doesn't have any impact on your life. You know, you can be an anti-vivisectionist and pat yourself on the back and say, I'm an animal person, I'm an anti-vivisectionist, and then not be a vegan. That's the problem. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I could just jump in really quickly, um, I don't want to monopolize, but um, I think what comes up for me is the, the idea that we talked about earlier in the context of animal rebellion around a recognition of the need for a cultural shift. And I, I understand the history and and you, you folks, and particularly Roger and Gary in this area, have a long, far longer than I do. Um, but I think that, yes, this is an issue and historically has been an issue, but this is the opportunity. So look at the, you know, uh, learning outcomes that Tim's talking about, like, okay, let's, let's address this and look to, you know, educate people in a way that we can get the cultural change. And because I mentioned in Rebellion, I, I do want to say, um, it tend by and large, this is a broad generalization. It's a, it's a younger crowd. They're in, incredibly enthusiastic. And my experience has been largely very flexible and interested in learning, interested in these learning outcomes that Tim references. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, the other piece hit on this topic, um, I've had exposure um, in my professional life to the uh, Alternative Research and Development Fund out of the American Anti-Vivus Section Society, the new uh, Center for Contemporary Sciences, looking to advance scientific alternatives to testing. So tech-based alternatives to testing, which I just wanna enter into the conversation, which I think is promising and should be supported. That stuff's been around forever. And yes, it's great if you can, you know, it's great. Um, there's always a lot of resistance against that stuff. Scientists really resist that stuff. Um, and, you know, and again, you know, when you talk about cultural shift, I guess I hate to be, I, I, I hate to bring it back to veganism, but my view is cultures ain't never going to change until we really take a real stab at, 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 you know, the veganism and, you know, really, really embrace veganism as a movement. And I go back to what I said before, it, it is not even regard, it is not even embraced uniformly by the movement as a moral imperative clearly as a moral imperative to the point where how many groups are willing to say if you're not a vegan you're involved in animal exploitation and we're opposed to animal exploitation so you really need to change groups don't do that because they're businesses and because to take that position is going to reduce their, their donor base bottom line is nothing's ever going to change phil you know my, i i really believe that 
that once you stop eating them for moral reasons, everything changes. And until you stop eating them for moral reasons, nothing changes. And it's just taking little pot shots at this, that, and the other thing doesn't really amount to a hill of beans. And I don't think it does affect the cultural shift. Maybe I'm wrong. That's, that's right. valid, Gary. I think there's some points about you made there about some of the, the bigger funded groups. But um, it's an interesting one that the Hunt Sabs have, if, you know, Roger mentioned, which is obviously a grassroots volunteer uh, group, um, which, which isn't funded, um, is, is, is sh you know, down at Camp Beagle in solidarity. And, and it's, it's interesting, that, you know, the, how much influence? So I know with the Hunt Sabs, they don't have a clear vegan, you know, message. But, but it, what we do know is over the last 50 years, you go, you get picked up and hunt sabs and you go out sabbing for the day and you're not vegan, you're going to be with a bunch of people who are. And, and pretty quickly, I think, you will be, you know, changing quite quickly the way you are. And there is an argument to say certainly that these things like the camps and the, the demos, I think clearly there's a desire. We saw this actually, Roger and I saw a video from Camp Beagle just yesterday where this guy was saying, oh, you know, I've come down here. I'm not vegan. I want to dispel any myth that you have to be vegan to support Camp Beagle. All you've got to do is want to see these dogs released. And, and it, you know, on the one hand, that underpinned exactly what you're saying, Gary, that, you know, it's just a shift. To, it's just an excuse, really. Um, and you carry on, you know, you're not prepared to change, you just carry on. Um, but on the other hand, there is a group that is going to maybe, you know, influence. And as Roger pointed out, there's a sociological need and, and there's some benefits and knock-on effects from that 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 learning outcome, that, that, that sharing vegan food and sharing a vegan culture whilst people are visiting these places, if they're not vegan, you know, the idea, I guess, is to A, welcome them in to support the Animal Rebellion or the, the Camp Beagle, both of which are really not, you know, funded or anything. They're not set up to earn money. They're, they're grassroots. And and uh, in doing so, not only are supporting those campaigns, but you're actually going to meet a bunch of vegans and you're going to become, you know, vegan <laughs> is the idea. But I think it's fair to say the Hunt Sabs could be one of the best, biggest vegan outreach groups without even trying over the last 50 years in the UK, that that could be, I've got no data to say that, but anecdotally, there could be potentially a case to be said for that. Um, so Camp Beagle, um, let's quickly move on because we don't want to go on too long. Uh, I know you've all got time, you're generously given up. Um, the fur campaigns, now look, these are another ones that have been going on for ages, but seemingly achieving nothing and also got some fairly, you know, misogynistic and classist uh, sort of uh, undertones too, quite often. Um, Philip, there's been some notable developments in the, the sort of fur campaigns in the USA recently, I believe, isn't it? The Saks, Saks Closure and the, 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 the Met Ball this week and one or two other notable mm -hmm. knock-on. To, to, to bring us up to speed a bit with you on, on those, uh, those campaigns, so I guess, quite recent. Sure. So the highlights on that would be that um, two high-end U.S. Real, retailers, um, Neiman Marcus and Saks Fifth Avenue, have committed to phasing out for, I believe, by next year broadly is what I'm recalling. Um, and that's, you know, that is significant. These are you know, in the U.S. certainly recognize, you know, names as um, high prestige um, brands. Um, most recently, um, the designer Oscar de la Renta, fashion designer, fashion house, uh, committed to eliminate fur. And it's my understanding it was at the uh, imperative of the pop singer Billie Eilish. Uh, so the celebrity vegan issue rears its head here, um, and I won't go down that ho rabbit hole, but um, she, at my understanding is she expended her political capital, which is considerable at this point, and she is vegan, uh, and has been, as a, my understanding, for a long time, or a significant amount of time, 
um, to demand that uh, in order that she, I think, wear the, the Oscar de la Renta at this, the Met Ball, um, which, and the ball significantly was, um, the meal served was plant-based food. There's a, there's a U.S. political angle to that. I don't want to go too far afield, but um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wore a dress, a white dress that in big red letters said tax the rich on the back, which caused, uh, got a lot, a big response in the U.S. Uh, she's a democratic socialist um, elected from New York. So, so this is significant, I think, and, and with regard to the type of how it's significant, I think the, the point that was made earlier uh, about the, um, the, from a sociological standpoint, the, the value of some wins for people to keep, you know, moving ahead as activism, fighting what could be called, I would call the most challenging social justice, you know, um, claim and uh, advancing the most, the movement that gets the, the greatest resistance of any on the planet, right? Um, even among self-avowed leftists, right? I, I encounter regularly um, resistance to any speciesism just the, the species is conditioning is so strong so i think that's that piece is is significant like i resonate with that and i know um roger has talked about that he mentioned jay conroy also in his um you know on his youtube channel mentioning that and and i would agree with that i think from you know this to me comes down to the 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 primal issue that we've kind of been tackling around the, is there a place for um, incremental change when the goal is, you know, revolutionary, um, a, a revolutionary goal of, to, you know, um, animal liberation, right? And I, I just want to introduce briefly um, in this regard, I, I came across the work of a German animal liberation uh, grassroots activist by the name of Friedrich Kirsch. And I, I saw a presentation he did in the, on the 2020 International Animal Rights Conference that I, I found really compelling. And he advanced the idea of what he, a formulation he created called um, revolutionary realpolitik, right? So for those who may not be familiar with the term realpolitik, um, it's from a, a 20, early 20th century uh, social justice activist by the name of Rosen Luxemburg, um, defined as politics based on practical and material factors rather than on theoretical or ethical objectives. So very, very pragmatic to, to the nth degree. Um, and what this activist Frieda Kirsch is talking about is as a revolutionary real politic borrowing from Luxemburg's conception to say that pra defining it as practical politics with transform transformational oriented objectives and means. So trying to kind of hold both of these um, imperatives um, at the same time. And I think, I think it bears consideration. Um, you know, um, in this talk, uh, I just want to mention specifically, Kirsch referenced a, a um, platform position statement by a labor aligned political party, German political party called the Free Workers Union and quoting said, we do not reject political reforms if they bring real improvements and are not in conflict with our goals, that being in this case, you know, animal liberation. However, we reject reformism as an attitude that does not attempt to fundamentally change the existing condition. I think I think that's really I think that's a significant it, it's aspirational it's it requires a, a deep commitment I think to working for real change now getting some wins getting activists feeling like they're making progress but never losing sight of the goal of of animal liberation Phil I think if Rosa Luxemburg knew that you were invoking her in the context of the anti fur campaign she would spin in her grave. Perhaps. Um, I mean, I, I think, I, I think that um, the anti-fur campaign is Plato's form of nonsense. 
Um, I mean, it, it has, we've had it for as long as I've been in the movement, as long as Roger's been in the movement, there's been an anti fur campaign. It is, it, it, it typifies the two main problems of single issue campaigns. One is that it sends out a message that fur is, that there's a morally coherent distinction between fur and everything else. And you've got, as a matter of fact, I, I, this morning, um, I was looking at the Saks uh, uh, situation and they're going to be still selling shearling and leather and everything else. And it's like it's a it is typical of a single issue campaign. You get a group of people together and and they say, well, that is worse than everything that everybody else is doing. And that wearing fur is worse than wearing wool or wearing leather or wearing down or, you know, having down pride, whatever it is. And and I think that's a problem. I think that encourages continued exploitation. And the other problem that many sing, not all, but many single issue campaigns typify is that they focus on marginalized groups. And the anti-fur campaign has been vilely, vilely sexist. As a matter of fact, I, I think we need to think about uh, any support for that movement, putting aside the fact that I don't think it does a damn thing for animals, um, and is not shifting any paradigm. We need to think seriously about whether the anti-fur campaign is our participation in sexism and misogyny. It is vile, Phil. Just take a look at the imagery that has emerged over the past 60, 70 years around fur. It is appalling. And I think that, um, you know, I don't regard that what, what, the argument you just made is let's look for incremental change if it's got a, a, a meaning. And the, the thing is, that's that's what I hear when people say, well, what about civil rights um, that had incremental change? Don't you support that? And the answer is civil rights involves a situation where you've got persons. And the issue is, are the persons being treated fairly? And then there's a debate about whether or not the persons are being treated fairly. And there will be different arguments being made. And, you know, those of us on the left will take one position. Those of us on the right will take another position. And, and, but we're talking about persons and the treatment of persons. The problem that, the problem why the incremental approach doesn't work when we're talking about animals is we're talking about things. And you're not going to change the status of animals as things which exist completely outside the moral and legal community. You're not going to change that by doing something like getting Saks Fifth Avenue to stop selling fur. This is, in my judgment, a great distraction. Take that energy. I'm sorry, I'll go back to something I said in 1984 at a big meeting that we had in Washington, D.C. about whether animal advocates should support the Animal Welfare Act amendments, which affect, you know, which, which per pertain to vivisection. And I said then, I believe then, I believe even more strongly now that we need to put all of our energy, all of our energy in, and all of our resources into veganism because that's the only thing that's going to shift the paradigm. Nothing else will shift the paradigm. These things, these fur things are, are, in my judgment, are distractions and they're dangerous distractions because to the extent that anybody regards them as a victory, I think we've, I think, I think the movement is lost. Uh, obviously, we have different views on this. We should get together at the Greyhound Cafe next week and talk about it. But on a potentially jocular level, uh, when when Philip was talking about that kind of incremental approach within an Abolitionist framework, it reminded me of, of this, which you might recognize, Gary. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah. is chapter seven from from this. But I mean, like, I know that you said that you kind of regretted re uh, writing that in the end, in the sense that the conversation you thought that that would provoke never happened. And I suppose you're probably saying it, it can never, we're not in a position to do it. You know, we're not sophisticated enough to have that, that conversation. Is, is, that, is that what you would say now? Well, I, mean, I mean, the reason, chapter seven of Rain Without Thunder, first of all, was my first, I mean, it was, it was sort of throwing an idea out there. What I was trying to argue, Raj, was that, um, that, if you're going to have single issue campaigns, they have to basically be of a particular, they have to be explicitly based on abolitionist theory. That is, we have to make it clear that mm -hmm. we want to abolish exploitation and we're just taking, we're just, we're just taking, we're, we're, we're having an incremental approach to abolition. That's not what these campaigns do. 
I mean, you know, that's not what. No, I are. I agree with I agree with that. But I mean, you you have kind of suggested within a general opposition to single issues that single issues can be abolitionized. I mean, I think you said that in relation to rodeos and. Well, I, can, can they in theory be be abolitionized? And the answer is yes, they can. I've never seen one that is. I mean, that's the problem because the economics of single issue campaigns, Raj, is that you get you get these groups, these groups create these single issue campaigns. And the whole point of them is to have a large donor base of people who engage in problematic conduct, but then who point the finger to somebody else, whether it's women wearing fur or whether it's Asian people eating dogs or whether it's, you know, a, you know, Asian people bludgeoning, you know, dolphins or whatever. And it's always it's it's, it's this idea of finger pointing. Um, mm. And, 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 and it, it end up being fundraising on the grounds that they're, yeah. they're yeah. businesses. But w where where there is a greater chance of this kind of coming to pass, as it were, is in within the grassroots. Forget about the careerist level and the corporate level. In the grassroots, they can abolitionize by, for example, rather than coming up with single issue campaigns, they can come up with single issue events. And I would have thought that that fits your theory rather well. As I've said, if somebody's got an event going, if somebody's got a protest going on at a rodeo, and they're also distributing vegan literature and saying, look, this is really terrible and blah, blah, blah. That's fine. That very rarely happens. And I don't think, look, Raj, the, the reality is Raj, fur was a problem when you and I were young people involved in this movement. The, if anything has happened in the interim years as we've gotten older, as the fur industry has gotten bigger, <laughs> it's gotten more powerful. I mean, it just doesn't work. And 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 I'm I'm trying to be practical. So when, when when we had dark hair, and when when Philip had hair, and when um, <laughs> right when uh, Tim's hair was was long. But I mean, I did look at some of the press to do with this sax thing, and it's exactly what you're saying, to be honest. Because one of them is saying, well, we're not quite sure what they're going to do with all the other things that they sell, which involve other animals. And then you've got um, get other ones just saying, well, they're going to carry on selling leather and shearling, which is sheepskin and lambskin, right. you know, which has not been sheared too much. And also goatskin down and all that kind of stuff. And so in a sense, there's, there's, there's that going on. But there are also a little other thing which would give the activists a little bit of um, hope, I suppose, is that there's been a big increase in faux fur. And so as real fur comes down, faux fur goes up. So that that's one thing that they would point to, I, I suppose. But in terms of the general thing, we're just, we're just kind of jiggling commodities again because people go okay well we'll switch to the leather or we'll we'll go to alligator or, or whatever in fact one one of the issues was was saying that kind of like what 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 about um leather products um pony and calf hair one of them was talking about goose down feathers alligator leather and of course that's that's where it would go to the activists would say well we'll chase that we'll go after that next that's what they'd say in the same way as if is if you say, well, the trade will just go to Russia and China, they'll go, well, we'll, we'll encourage activists in Russia and China then to kind of do what we've done. That, that's, the, that's the activist mentality that I'm trying to suggest, you know? Well, but that, that, Raj, if, that, if that's happening, then it's news to me because the problem with these campaigns, by and large, is the people who are organizing the campaigns, the people who are the spokespeople of these campaigns, aren't saying, look, it's for today, but we recognize there's no distinction between fur and wool and leather and shearling and all this the, other stuff. The modern, the modern day activists would say that now, Gary. I mean, because you, you don't you don't get people outside fur shops with leather coats on anymore. You used to in the 80s, but you don't anymore. And it's usually a kind of grassroots um, abolitionist vegan group that are doing the fur campaign. And they would say that. I mean, like my, my position is that I think there might be a difference between shutting down these fur shops to shutting down the fur farms because the fur farms shutting down makes everything worse. And I did speak to the fur activists about that. And I said, well, look, no one gets saved. Everything gets moved to Russia and China, which makes the welfare worse. And that's a, that's a criteria that you care about. And also you make the fur farm operators, multimillionaires. And they said that they didn't care about any of those issues. They just wanted to
to get rid of fur farms in their country. So they've got a bit of um, myopic kind of vision in that sense. And, and when you look at a broader picture, then the kind of logic of it all kind of falls apart a little bit. But in terms of what they want at the time, I mean, this is Camp Beagle. You know, they, they want to just save those beagles. And I don't think that they're thinking about, well, does that mean it's going to be guinea pigs next? I don't think they're, they've thought that far, I don't think. Well, that's the problem. I mean, and, and look, as a practical matter, um, let's take all that energy and put it into vegan advocacy. And I think um, it's a no brainer to say that that, that would be that would be resources better spent. What, what, what I'd say on that is I go back to the social psychology of it, because I used to argue that I would say, look, if you want a victory, celebrate the victory of getting a new ethical vegan. That's right. And but it's not the same. They, they say it's not the same. If you ban something and you shut something down, it's kind of like cowboys in white hats, really. They've kind of identified an enemy and they've won a fight. But you're, not, you're not winning it. You're winning. It's, it's, it's a well, in their, in their mind. I mean, let's give them that in their mind. But in terms of actually convincing someone to live vegan, it doesn't feel the same in that kind of visceral, yeah, we fucking closed them down type thing. Right. That's the difference, I think, in the social well, psychology of it. Well, that, that that may be Roger, but I think then that means we ought to work on the social psychology because I think that's incoherent. I don't, I'm not what you're saying is incoherent. I'm saying that position is incoherent, and that we ought to be celebrating the new. It, str it strongly felt that's the, the real problem. I mean, I, I, and I, I I've come to recognize uh, um, that we're operating in a animal welfare movement that calls itself animal rights, and they're wedded to animal welfare things that went into animal welfare language. They're very stubborn about it. And they, they like what they know, and they know what they like. And it, it, it's very, this, that, that's kind of where they are. And, and you bringing about kind of change, even within the movement in this sense, is very difficult because there are a lot of people very stubborn set in their ways. Yeah, I, I, I'm very aware of that. And that's why I wrote Rain Without Thunder and Animals, Property and the Law, you know, back in mm -hmm. the 90s was the fact that we had an animal rights movement that was really stuck in an animal welfare ideology. The problem is, Raj, it's 2021, and it's still stuck in the goddamn animal welfare ideology. And so we're still talking about victories. In if, if, anything, if anything, Gary, to be honest, it's worse it's now. worse. I agree. Yeah. I, agree. I, I mean, agree. You, 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 look, you look at the influencers now on the YouTube generation. Yeah. They, can't, they, can't, they, can't have a, they can't say a sentence without, without talking about being an animal lover, cruelty, mercy for animals, all this kind of welfare compassion, stuff. Compassion, compassion, yes. Compassion. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, they, they, they just can't do it. So it's, it's even worse than it was, you know, when you were banging the drum on we need veganism with the moral baseline. It's worse now than it was then. I, I agree, Raj. I mean, when I, I was recently interviewed and somebody said, what, are, what, what, what do you think about rain, rain Without Thunder now? And I said, oh, that was a really optimistic book that I really believe things could change. Things are much worse now, much, much, much worse now than they were in 1996. That's the problem. And so, you know, I mean, I do believe, Roger, I mean, I, 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 I don't want you to think I'm, I'm entirely negative about this, but I do believe that we can have an abolitionist movement, but it can't exist, and I, I, you'd probably agree with this, I mean, it can't exist within the careerist structure, which is what defines the animal movement now. Yes, there may be some people who are not careerists. I agree, Tim. But by and large, the movement is is a careerist phenomenon in which people are giving free labor to to these organizations. And I don't think the discourse is ever going to change, and that the, the strategy is ever going to change until we challenge that. Now, you know, I mean, it it is it something we could do? Yeah, it's something we could do. And you know, but we've got to do it. We've got to make it happen. And right now, I don't really see it happening. And I I was actually, I mean, I I actually just become very frustrated when you know it's like, well, what do you think about um, you know the Saks Fifth Avenue fur ban? And it's like, you know, I just want to start weeping and saying you know, the same thing I thought about that thirty years ago. It's useless. Um, and and um, you know, but I mean, anyway. It's a mess, Raj. It's a mess. So, 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 Philip, why is it not useless? Again, I, I, I concur about the wins and that visceral win. Um, I think that there's potential that, that that is meaningful, and and 
I, and, I, and I don't want to make more. I personally, I'm not as engaged in this movement. Like I don't invest my time and energy, although I know people that do and I respect them. And, and to your point, they, these, the people that I know in New York who have been instrumental in realizing these wins um, are, ab you know, total liberation activists. Not, and by that, I mean, you know, beyond, you know, beyond just animal liberation, total liberation for all sentient beings. Um, but I just want to harken back to the promise. And again, I, I, I can speak from a greater experience with regard to animal rebellion. And I and others have been a voices saying the anti, you, what, what, what brought people in and what, what is keeping people in, they know this because they did a survey because it was a, a changing of the guard from the original founders, if you will. Some people came in and there was this question in people's minds. Um, well, do we, is the any species this position helpful or harmful? And there was a survey done, an internal survey in a rebellion, overwhelmingly in favor of the any speciesism. That's why the vast majority of people were there. Um, if you lost that, that's going to be a problem. And that was really encouraging. So I, I don't mean to def defer from this conversation. Um, I just don't have the knowledge base. But if if an animal rebellion can can maintain and hold both these, you know, things, the the revolutionary imperative and taking the wins and, and gaining welfare steps, as much as I dislike that word, I think that's got some potential. You know, I wrote a piece for um, for for a vegan on animal rebellion. And I started with a quote from Pascal that says, you know, a person shows greatness not by touching one extremity or the other, but by touching both and filling the space in between. And I think this is it's it's really easy to say and difficult to do, but I think that's that's the imperative. And two very quick points back to fur um, to be clear, like any the sexism within the anti fur movement, I abhor and I reject unequivocally. Personally, I will say that. Um, and the point being about, you know, people who, if, if it's we, the left, or, or a left position, to my mind, is inherently anti-capitalist. And that's, that's a, a, a deliberately provocative statement for the next panel, but I want to leave that on the table because I think that's, um, that's the elephant in the room, if you will. But, uh, uh, in response to Roger's question, so why do you think that it's not worthless? You said because it it gives the win, it provides the win, the, the the rush that you get with the win. But that doesn't address the other point that Roger made, which is why is it that may, that converting another person to veganism is not the thing that gives you the sugar rush? You know, why is it why is it the 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 fur thing? Why is it the you know why is it the other single issue campaign that that provides the rush and not the conversion to veganism. That's the $64 million question, in my judgment, that's that's the question. And and to say, well, you know, because it provides the rush, it doesn't answer the question about why it provides the rush rather than something which has a greater meaning. I would also say this, I don't know what, what people you're talking about in New York who do the any first stuff, but I mean, there's been stuff on the, uh, you know, I mean, it's, some, of those, some of those folks um, have engaged on YouTube and on YouTube videos in vilely sexist uh, language, and and I think that's a serious problem. And I think we need to make that clear. We need to reject that. Say whatever the hell you think yeah. about single issue campaigns. Um, this folk, this this sexism and this misogyny is just no, absolutely not. The problem is the fur movement really has. There is no fur movement without the sexism and misogyny. I mean, there really isn't, and um, unfortunately. Really Thanks, I, folks. I, um, I, yeah, Philip, did you want to say something? No, no, just, just, I defer. I wasn't trying to, to avoid answering the question. I don't have the knowledge base about why the, why one gives the rush and not the other. I, sociologists like Roger probably would have a better idea, but I think that's that's a, 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 a point worthy of exploring. And I think that could also be a future you know, conversation. I, the, the clue is in the James Dean quote, surely. Um, it was James Dean, wasn't it? It was asked, uh, what you're rebelling against? And it's, well, what have you got? And uh, I think, you know, a lot of these campaigns do appeal to that rebellious streak, the, the desire to, to change 
There's nothing more rebellious than veganism, though. Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. We know that. We know that. But it's it's a, it's a revolution. It's a revolution, and and the people who started the vegan social movement saw it like that. They saw it as moral evolution of humanity. They had a, a brilliant vision of the future, and it's yeah. it wasn't cupcakes, and it wasn't you know organizations. It, it was a future of non-violence, peace, and all the rest of it. It's a, you know kind of utopian, if you like, but something really worth working for. Yeah, I agree, and I think credit too to some of those organizations you mentioned that are actually, they are pretty much, you know, they're, they're looking, you know, they're, they're on the same page. They're looking to end the use of animals. So they've, they've adopted a, a rights I mean, I mean, but look, the, look, but Tim, look at the vegan society where you have people like Leslie Cross, well, I know, let's not get that, but, but you have, you have people like Leslie Cross who was, I mean, he, he, he was a really profoundly interesting guy. Yeah. Who really had a vision of social change, and and saw saw the vegan movement as sort of a modern day peace movement. I mean, it was a very very progressive. Now look at the vegan society. Now look at the vegan society. But there's there are some aspects of the vegan society, and I would, I would take your point. Um, but um, there are also aspects of not only the society, but quite a lot of these campaigns that are really you know credit where credits to you. There's a lot of really good work going on towards helping people understand veganism. Um, right. And I can think, you know, a, num a number of, of of individuals and people, I mean, you know, just that, the, Roger, your show, you know, when I think of some of the, the activists that have been a part of your show, not only in the UK and Dublin and such, but from different parts of the world. And, you know, there is a, a growing rights-based movement, I would say, and, and, and quietly, I would say that these ideas and that position, the reason being is because it's, it's the, the position that makes sense. And it's the one that, that the logic stands up to. When you're someone like Benny Malone and you've got your book about arguing with vegans, you know, the, the, the animal rights ethical position. Yeah, but we're back to where we started, though, Tim. We're back to where we started. We're trying to crowbar a rights based thing into a welfare structure. And it's it's never worked. Nobody's nobody ever managed to do it because the welfare structure is resilient. It it creates quite a lot of funds and stuff. And so in terms of that, they they would resist that. And and the rights based position has been resisted ever since it existed. And so I mean um, I mean just listen to to Gary and Anna's um, kind of tribute to to Tom Reagan shortly after Tom died and. Um, you know, he 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 was he was bullied mercil mercilessly by this welfare movement. I mean, you know, this movement treated Tom Reagan disgustingly, I think, Absolutely. and it's it's, be, it's because he, he he tried to bring animal rights into the animal rights movement, and and he was it wasn't welcome. They thought this is a bit of a bad smell. We'd we'd rather stay with with welfare. Thanks very much. Uh, I mean, it's, it's absolutely. So I mean, I, I wrote a, a piece, um, uh, Roger, about uh, after Tom died, I wrote an essay in Between the Species and about um, what happened. And, you know, and I, I, I uh, you know, I, I found a lot of letters and documents that I had from that time. And um, they were actually very painful for me to review because I actually thought we were going to get I thought I thought we were very close. And, and I think in many ways we were. And that was what what provoked the reaction of the large groups. They just got very, very upset and and they came after us. And I said to Tom, look, Tom, I've been dealing with this now for a number of years. This is just what happens. They get upset. They call you divisive. Da, 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 da. Just forget about it. Keep keep moving. Around. And and I think he was he was very, very put off by it. Um, he was intimidated by it. And and when you think about it, Tom wasn't even I mean, yes, Tom was Tom was focused on rights. Absolutely. But Tom wasn't even arguing that this was true for, for all sentient beings. He was basically saying he had to be a subject of a life. I mean, it was actually in many ways a conserv in terms of the, the animals who were covered. It was somewhat conservative in its coverage. And and, you know, he was so he was saying that animals that sort of have have a have a, have a you know, who are self-aware. I mean, for all, for all intents and purposes, subject of a life is someone who's self self-aware, that self-aware uh, beings have a have a right to respect 
which excludes their use as exclusively as resources. It wasn't even in many ways with its coverage all that terribly radical. And yet, it, it, I mean, I, I will never forget the sorts of discussions we had with the careerists out there when we were doing our presentation, we were doing the Tom and Gary show and we were going around talking about rights versus welfare. And, and we were being threatened, basically. I mean, it was just appalling. And so I, I agree with you completely. We are trying to, you know, we are trying to shoehorn a rights movement into a welfare structure and the welfare structure is impossible. You can't do it. You just have to get rid of it. And the only way you get rid of it is, in my judgment, by promoting veganism as a moral imperative and to hell with all this stuff, with these welfare reforms, these single issue campaigns, drive ahead on veganism. And somehow, Raj, and I don't know how the hell we do it, but somehow we've got to get people turned on by the idea that they've turned, they've gotten somebody to go vegan. And, you know, I always tell them, look, if you get one person to go vegan in the next year and then all the vegans who are who are now in existence do that and then that happens for the next 14 years the world is vegan so the power of one what you can do on an individual basis we need to get people excited about that i think there are people excited about that i think a lot of people who are into the abolition stuff are excited about every one that they get to go vegan the problem is is that the overall institutional structure still provides you know still 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 is there to provide the sugar rush for the, you know, the incremental changes in the welfare reform. Mm. And, and, to, and to build on what Philip said about kind of capitalism, if we've got a movement that just mirrors the system that you, <laughs> you're complaining about, is, that's not going to help either. And we do have a very corporate structure. And in terms of, I mean, I know we shouldn't probably use the word careerist, but I've done it for years. And um, but I mean, there's more of them now than, than ever before, you know, Absolutely. and so but whether that's a bad thing, I, I don't know. I'm not opposed to people getting wages or even being supported by by others. Um, I don't like the idea of people swarming off to Panama and all that. But um, in, in in terms of, of, of the grassroots supporting people, I mean, that's it happened all the time. I mean, that's how the SABs, you know, you get funded and, you know, pe people who couldn't go SABing would would help the saps and all that and so I'd, i get all that but in terms of the actual structure the structural thing we're back we're back to structure versus agency really and and you know w w what's what's going to do it and you know can you change the structure um which doesn't want to be changed and i mean that's where we started the conversation isn't it yeah we need more panels yes. we need more panels Okay, well, look, we've been chatting an hour and a half now, so um, I'm going to invite you all back for December and I'm going to invite you to pick your own topics this time. This is a sort of introductory session to start talking about some of these issues. Um, you know, one of the reasons I picked Animal Rebellion is because they're current, but also because they already have an anti speciesist message in place. It's just how strong and how robust that is. Now, Camp Beagle is really interesting because it is going back to that original with the anti-vivisection. Um, one wonders, though, what sort of, you know, what, what's happening? What, 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 what is the, the baseline at Camp Beagle? You know, is there a vegan, is it a vegan camp? You know, with the fur campaigns, I think we all agree, you know, especially with the misogyny and the sexism. It's a deeply what we refer to, you know, pro pro problematic campaigns and at the same time. I don't think there's any dispute with the dedication and the bravery and the commitment and the desire of these activists to um, want to achieve liberation and change. Uh, so, so I think it's a case. Of I, don't, I don't think I don't think anybody doubted that. No. No, I think we should we should underpin that though because it's important and we should always reassure uh, activists to keep keep active and and to keep listening and learning and improving. Yeah, we're all in favor of people being active. We just think that they should be doing a difference, or at least some of yeah, them. Yeah, well, I definitely agree. I mean, it's straightforward. Promoting veganism um, is, you know, that actually became a big form of activism. Uh, two years ago, there was over 300 vegan events in the UK, vegan fairs, and they were a great gateway to be, you know, a lot of them had a, a really strong vegan underpinning position. And... Um, Become a very popular form of activism, I think, in many ways, probably more effective uh, promoting veganism um, than uh, you know some of these quite challenging campaigns like the fur campaigns. But 
Then look, I, mean, I, think, I think having these these festivals that you have where people actually can show up and eat themselves sick on vegan food, you know, and go around and just, I mean, that my view is, look, that gets people, you want to talk about like something that is not ideological or not, you know, that, that gets people sort of saying, oh, wow, they don't really eat styrofoam and things like that. I think that's great. I mean, that's tremendous. Keep doing that. I mean, um, what's know, wrong with vegan styrofoam? That's what I want to know. But, yeah. um, I mean, I mean, Plus, building on what you said, Tim, the subject that I would look at, I think, or would like to look at as a movement issue, is the distinction which is very difficult between vegan and plant-based. Because I think it's a real distinction. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I think that if we were very honest about it, I think that the numbers of vegans is still very low. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the UK estimates at the last count, the Ipsos Murray poll in... Uh, well, these are self declared uh, people, aren't they? Here, 2019, yeah, but it was interesting to declare yourself as an ethical vegan or as a dietary vegan or as, as a flexitarian or something. And, you know, the estimate there was of, from the Ipsos Murray, which is a you know 10,000 sample statistically. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty good standard of, of sample. Um, gave a, a 600,000 figure in the UK of ethical vegans. Um, it's safe to say that we've probably grown in the last two years, um, but but um, that I think we all agree is the key is that the the ethical vegan is the position and that's the forefront of all our campaigns. It should be the forefront of all our messages, and that if we have, as Gary said, you know, individual growth, we should be celebrating that. Absolutely. And I'm sure there are a lot of people, I know this for a fact, do celebrate that. We're definitely not alone here. There's some fantastic activists working all the time promoting an ethical vegan position. And, and there, that's that's the position. I think that's the key. So as I said, I'll invite you all back and I'm going to ask you this time to pick, pick your own topics um, or talk. Perhaps we may have some conversations before. We've also got invite people to feedback and we'll place comments in the comments section. I don't think there's anything to address particularly, nor are we particularly in time because we've been kind of, I don't think my tech man too, he's got to get some sleep before we go again tomorrow. But I think this has been really valuable. It's great to, to, to look at these issues. We need more um, support, guidance, debate, critique. We really need a, a, a rapidly growing global vegan movement. Uh, of that, I'm sure we're all agreed. Um, so, Gary, thanks very much for joining us. I know you've been Thank you for inviting me. Difficult circumstances today. Appreciate you for joining us, and you'd be very welcome back in the December. Do give us some, you know, some feedback. Have a little think if you want to develop that the platforms. Thank platforms you. Um, Roger, it's been brilliant. It's just such a pleasure to see both of you, Gary, chatting again together. That's a real important for the movement too that people can can have disagreements but it can also come back together and i i would say the key is if if you're putting the animals first then that that's it's always going to be easier and i'm very grateful for that and roger all the work you've been doing especially during lockdown been phenomenal really good guidance solid leadership um and philip you know again too and we've been staunch with our little events over the last year or two are uh, really good and the work you're doing with axr i think it's really valuable good good solid there to, 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 to be supportive. Um, and I hope the listeners, you've enjoyed this this little show. Um, I've certainly enjoyed it. It's, it's been a real pleasure, privilege and honour. And we shall hopefully see you all again tomorrow. And for this panel, we shall revert again in December for a solstice gathering. Thanks very yeah, much. It's, it's an early start, people. 9am 9, 9 for the Vegan Songstress. Yeah, that's for the vegan song stress. Tomorrow a.m., 9 a.m., BST, Sunday, 19th September, 2021. Good night. Bless. Thank you. Take care. Take care, everyone.